Hello there, I'm your host Kareem Fazakri. You're watching All24 News live from Algiers. Coming up next are the top stories. President Taboon chairs a cabinet meeting devoted to presentations on many sectors of endeavor. Also coming up, U.S. military shut down a Chinese high-altitude balloon, believing it was involved in espionage. Beijing refused this and accused Washington of overreacting. West supply of weapons and new sanctions on Russia stirs international warnings of complicating the war further. Also ahead in our news. And Pakistani ex-president dies in a hospital in Dubai at the age of 79 after a prolonged illness. Hello again, those were today's headlines. Welcome to the program. First in our news, Mr. Abdul Majid Taboon, President of the Republic, Supreme Head of the Armed Forces, Minister of National Defense, chaired a cabinet meeting devoted to presentations on the state of the knowledge economy and startups, the university training system and its modernization, electronuclear energy in Algeria, and the progress report on the execution of the general population and housing census. The examination of the bill relating to the firm or the film industry having been postponed to a later date. After the opening of the meeting by the President of the Republic and the presentation of the agenda, the Prime Minister presented the government's activity report. The President then gave his instructions and guidelines. To a different story now, Mauritania's main opposition party, the Rally of Democratic Forces, announced its participation in the upcoming parliamentary, municipal and regional elections, which Mauritania is preparing to organize next May. The party led by opposition leader Ahmed Weldada called on his activists and supporters at the end of an extraordinary conference on Saturday to participate in the registration process on the electoral list and to defend the party's approach of its political declaration. This extraordinary conference is taking place in a national circumstances, characterized by an atmosphere of openness and political calm in a clear break with a method of dealing with the opposition that was followed by previous rulings. The President of the Republic, the Secretary General of the Polisario Front, Brahim Ghali, confirmed that the first regular session of the National Secretariat after the 16th Congress of the Front constitutes a fundamental stage in the path of national action between two conferences. President Ibrahim Ghali highlighted that everyone is aware of the sensitivity and seriousness of the stage and the requirements in terms of recruitment, preparedness and readiness for the Sahrawi Republic. Morocco's external debt rose by the end of last year to $22 billion, an increase of 13% compared to the year 2021, an unprecedented level which is expected to, to increase with Bank Al Maghreb's intention to issue international bonds of about $13 billion during the current year.
Moving on now to neighboring Libya. Libyan leaders affirmed the need for constitutional rule in order to focus on reaching elections. Several members of the Libyan House of Representatives expressed concern about the country's current political stalemate. Zarafar Jenny with more details in this report. The head of the Libyan National Unity Government, Abdel Hamid al Dubeiba, the head of the United Nations mission in the country, Abdullahi Batili, discussed on Sunday practical proposals for holding elections as soon as possible. The two underlined the need for a constitutional rule in order to focus on the elections. After a meeting with the members of the Libyan House of Representatives, Abdullahi Batili expressed his optimism for the positive and constructive involvement of both the State Council and the House of Representatives in the political process. The House of Representatives and the High Council of State must engage positively and constructively to reach a constitutional framework for elections as soon as possible. Libya today is facing a stage that calls for expediting the search for consensual solution that satisfies all parties. Batili urged Libyan leaders to end the differences in the country's current stalemate to reach the aspirations of the 3 million Libyans registered to vote. We stress the need to end the current stalemate in Libya and to move towards reaching presidential and parliamentary elections. All Libyan leaders must meet the aspirations of the 2.8 million Libyans who registered to vote. Since the start of the Libyan crisis in 2011, decision-making has been difficult due to lack of consensus within parties. Yet, with the commitment of the 8th UN envoy to Libya, progress has been made to put an end to the dispute and the political division. The chairman of the Transitional Sovereignty Council in Sudan, Lieutenant General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, renewed the Sudanese armed forces' keenness to adhere to the democratic transition through the implementation of the framework agreement. Al-Burhan confirmed that the framework agreement does not aim to impose the control of the specific political faction and exclude others, with the exception of the dissolved National Congress Party, calling on all political parties to reach a national consensus on managing the period, similar to some countries that went through transitional experiences just like Sudan and succeeded in overcoming them. The agreement that we had is going to be our path until we reach the final stage. We're going to take this path to unify Sudanese people. We, the armed forces, commit to work for the service of the people and we will not leave the country in need of any service. Still in Africa, regional East, Eastern African leaders have called for an immediate ceasefire by all parties in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Tensions there have grown amid talk of war as Congo and neighboring Rwanda trade allegations of backing armed rebels. The ceasefire call was issued in a communique at the end of the East African Community Summit in Burundi. The head of state directed also as follows. One, there must be immediate ceasefire by all political parties. Two, the withdrawal, including all foreign armed groups and directed the chief of defense forces of all the partner states of the East African community to meet urgently within the next one week and set new timelines for the withdrawal and recommend appropriate deployment matrix in different parts of Eastern DRC. And they also discussed that this process must be accompanied by dialogue. So it is first secession, ceasefire, and then followed by withdrawal, and then dialogue. And any violations of this must be reported immediately to the chairperson of the, of the summit for immediate consultations with members of the summit. Moving on now, as part of the intensive raids of the Zionist forces in the West Bank, seven Palestinian civilians have been arrested in a different camp and neighborhoods around the West Bank. This comes at a time when Zionist occupiers staged demonstrations against policies of their new government. More in this report by our own Usam Ayati. Zionist forces arrested seven Palestinians from the West Bank cities of Jenin and Beit Lahm. 
As part of the tense raids that they are carrying out against defenseless Palestinian civilians, the forces arrested four Palestinians from a Taiba village at a checkpoint near Nablus Ramallah Road and set up another checkpoint near the Arab American University, southeast of Jenin, stopping and interrogating students. We condemn the measures taken against the city under false pretexts and reasons. It's an ugly form of collective punishment against defenseless Palestinian civilians. Zionist forces also arrested three Palestinians from different areas in Beit Lahm, with age range between 28 and 32. After raiding and searching two of their houses, they also confiscated a laptop belonging to one of them. At the same time, large military force and police brutally raided the house of the director of Wadi Hilwa Information Center, Jawad Sayam, in East Al Qud's neighborhood of Silwan, to arrest him without showing an official court order. The measures lead to a blow to the economies of the Palestinians and put obstacles in the way of citizens pursuing their work and their industrial, agricultural, and tourism projects. In parallel with the continued Zionist crimes against Palestinian unarmed civilians, Thousands of occupation citizens joined staged demonstrations for the fifth consecutive week against judicial reform plans by new government. Protesters say the changes will threaten democratic checks and balances on ministers by the courts and accuse Netanyahu of trying to escape a legal case against him. Iran's supreme leader on Sunday reportedly ordered an amnesty or reduction in prison sentences for tens of thousands of people detained amid nationwide anti-government protests shaking the country, acknowledging for the first time the scale of the crackdown. The decree by Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, part of a yearly pardoning the supreme leader does before the anniversary of Iran's 1979 Islamic revolution comes as authorities have yet to say how many people they detained in the demonstrations. The supreme leader of the Islamic Revolution agreed to pardon and reduce the punishment of tens of thousands of defendants and convicts on the occasion of the 44th anniversary of the victory of the Islamic Revolution and the holy month of Rajab. To other topical news, Pakistan's former President General Parvez Musharraf has died at the age of 79 at a hospital in Dubai after a prolonged illness. Tributes and messages of condolences have poured in from Pakistani politicians to the deceased family. The former leader seized power from former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif in a military coup in 1999 and appointed himself President in 2001 while remaining ahead of the army. He continued to lead Pakistan as president until 2008. Musharraf became a key ally of the United States and tried to become an indispensable figure in combating extremism. But his time in power was marred with controversy and he was accused of widespread human rights abuses and oppression. As we all know that he was known for, uh, for actually uh, unleash this misadventure in Kargil. But on the other side, actually in 2000, uh, uh, 2004, he actually, um, along with Indian Prime Minister, initiated a peace process. Uh, and through uh, back channel, the negotiation went. And I think probably that two, three years was the best of the time in the relationship between India and Pakistan. With Pakistan-related news still, Pakistani police arrested four terrorists in the country's northwest Swabi district on Saturday as part of a security step-up after suicide bombing attack. This comes after police personnel conducted a raid on the terrorist hideout, receiving information about their presence in the district. A senior police official said to media outlets that the arrested terrorists were planning to launch attacks on security forces and sensitive installations in the province. Ukraine is expecting a possible major Russian offensive this month, while not all the West's latest military supplies will have arrived in time. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has warned that the situation on the Eastern Front Line was getting tougher, with Russia throwing more and more troops into battle to break down Ukrainian defenses. Here's Sofyan Kenturi with more. 
The support for Ukraine has been neither consistent nor prompt. The sanctions against Russia will yet to have much more effects and repercussions to come. The West made several deals to arm Kiev under immense pressure despite international warnings. A few weeks ago, Germany and US have confirmed that they will supply Ukraine with about 47 tanks, while the Pentagon on Friday announced more than $2 billion in new military aid. For his part, Dmitry Kuliba, Ukrainian foreign minister, revealed the number of tanks Ukraine will receive as a first wave of deliveries from a coalition of 12 countries. I can note that in the first wave of contributions, the Ukrainian armed forces will receive between 120 and 140 Western modern tanks. Despite the flow of Western weapons to Ukraine, Russia has claimed gains in recent days around Kharkiv and heavy firing was underway on Sunday in northern parts of the frontline hotspot Bakhmut. It is very tough in the Donetsk region. There are fierce battles. However, no matter how difficult it is, and no matter how strong the pressure is, we have to endure. We have to use every day and every week to reinforce our defense at the front. Ukraine's defense minister said the reluctance of Kiev's western allies to send jets would cost it more lives. Meanwhile, Ukrainians expect possible major Russian offensive this month. Ukrainian defense minister said the offensive would likely be launched in the east where Russia is trying to capture all the heavily industrialized Donbass region. Despite everything, we expect a possible Russian offensive in February. This is only from the point of view of symbolism. It's not logical from a military view, because not all their resources are ready, but they are doing it anyway. Speaking about sanctions against Russia, the Ukrainian president said that he's coordinating efforts with Western allies about another package of sanctions. More sanctions are not currently impacting the Kremlin as much as they are impacting the West. The risk of an escalation is on the verge, so this decision is being studied by Western nations and the United States as well. Still with the Russia-Ukraine file, Europe has imposed a new ban on Russian diesel fuel and other refined oil products, slashing energy dependency on Moscow and seeking to further crimp the Kremlin's fossil fuel earnings. Sunday's ban comes along with a price cap agreed by the group of seven allied countries, the United States, Britain, Germany, France, Italy, Japan and Canada. The goal is allowing Russian diesel to keep flowing to countries such as China and India and avoiding a sudden price rise that would hurt consumers worldwide while reducing the profits funding Moscow's budget. In response to the agreement, the Kremlin said the embargo would further and balance global energy markets. Our attitude towards the new round of sanctions is negative, as we have discussed. This will lead to a further imbalance in the international energy markets. But we are taking measures to hedge our interests against the risks associated. To Europe now, French Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne offered on Sunday to soften a planned pension overhaul to let some people who started work early also retire early in order to win conservative support for the reform in Parliament. President Emmanuel Macron's government wants to raise the retirement age two years to 64 and extend the period workers have to pay in as part of the reform to, it says, is necessary to keep the system out of the red in the coming years. We're going to move by extending the measure for long careers to those who started working at 20 and 21. They will be able to retire at 63. The race to become the eighth president of Cyprus will extend into a second week after the Mediterranean island's former foreign minister Nikos Christodolidis emerged as the front runner but failed to gain enough support to win outright. The 49-year-old independent will face Andreas Mavro Yanis, a veteran career diplomat backed by the leftist Akel Party, in a runoff on February 12th. Results by or results released by the Interior Ministry showed Cresto Dolides winning 32.04% of the vote in Sunday's election and an unexpectedly strong showing of 29.6% for his opponent. 
Today is a celebration. Today is the day for democracy. Every Cypriot can with their votes determine the future of our country. Today, through their vote, the people will decide the course of the country, and that which will count is the result of the ballot box. I have confidence that with their vote and their participation, they will lead the country towards better days. Ecuadorians voted on a constitutional referendum on Sunday that is promoted by President Guillermo Lasso and focused on citizen security, institutionalism and the environment. Voters will cast a ballot on eight questions of national interest. One of the key issues is the approval of the extradition of Ecuadorians who have committed crimes. During the elections, some 13 million Ecuadorians will also elect mayors, municipal councillors and governors who will take office in May for a four-year term. For Ecuadorians, this will be a great opportunity. We must be part of the solutions of the country's urgent problems and take another step towards strengthening democracy. We hope the referendum will bring about a change in our country because crime is affecting us and through the referendum we are looking for a change of life. Authorities in Chile extended an emergency declaration as firefighters struggled to control dozens of raging wildfires that killed 22 people in connection to the fires and 554 have been injured, including 16 in serious condition, according to the Interior Minister. Therefore, the government declared a state of emergency in the region south of Nuble and Biobio. Climate is still tense in Peru as thousands of protesters took part in the biggest demonstration that the country has known since the beginning of the mobilization last December. The riot already caused 48 deaths. According to the organizers, all the communities were gathered in the center of the capital, Lima, to shout the rejection of President Dina Boluarte. The U.S. shut down the Chinese balloon, claiming it was spying on key military sites in the U.S., while Beijing has condemned Washington and accused it of overreacting and saying it was only an accident. The details with our own Islam Sid. Sitting in my driveway here. Two balloons were spotted flying over the American continent. The U.S. claimed the one observed on its lands is used for spying on its military sites, while China says it was a civilian and manned airship used for research only. The balloon was shot down by a U.S. fighter jet off the coast of South Carolina, following the order of U.S. President Joe Biden on Saturday. Order the Pentagon to shoot it down on Wednesday as soon as possible. They decided without doing damage to anyone on, on the ground. Beijing accused Washington of seriously breaching international conventions, reiterating that the balloon diverged its course due to bad weather only. Chinese Foreign Ministry said it would reserve the right to do what it takes to deal with similar situations. The U.S. use of force is a clear overreaction and a serious violation of international practice. China will resolutely safeguard the legitimate rights and interests of the company concerned and reserves the right to make further responses if necessary. Both sides seemed keen to mend relations after turbulent years. But after this incident, which made U.S. Secretary Antony Blinken postpone his visit to China, this recent efforts to fix ties seem to have gone in vain. China's decision to fly a surveillance balloon over the continental United States is both unacceptable and irresponsible. We took the step that uh, I um, announced earlier today in postponing the planned visit for this weekend. Woo! It might be a satisfying moment to see the balloon go down for some in the U.S., but China's response is expected to start from Taiwan Island, as Western provocations have never stopped there, according to observers. In fact, the U.S. has already waged a war against China in chips industry, forming an alliance with Japan, South Korea and Taiwan, as the latter is seen as the largest and most important producer of chips in the world. People gathered in Baghdad on Sunday to protest the killing of 22-year-old YouTube blogger Tiba Ali on January 31st in the southern province of Diwaniya. The protesters called for an end to the violence and crimes against women. We're not only here for Tiba today. 
but for the hundreds, dozens of women who are killed like Tiba. It's about the law and not about Tiba personally. Well, that's the end of our news. For more, you can visit our social media platforms. From me and the rest of the English team, thank you for watching and bye for now.